Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 200.5 of the Strength Coach Podcast, the official podcast of Michael Boyle, strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information. You can try strengthcoach.com out for three days, just a buck. You'll have access to all the articles, videos, and programs, as well as the best forum on the net. It's the only place to have full access to Coach Boyle. He's on every day. Check it out at strengthcoach.com. All right, I'm your host, Anthony Rand, and the show notes are located at strengthcoachpodcast.com. You want to get in touch with me, shoot me an email to strengthcoachpodcast at gmail.com. All right, today, so I have another special episode of the podcast, and basically, I'm just replaying my interview with Coach Boyle from my other podcast, Stop and Give Me 20, 20 Minutes with some of the world's top fitness professionals. Now, there's two reasons why I'm doing this. One, I'm having some problems with the internet, and I'm in the middle of changing service provider so my schedule is a little up in the air and I couldn't really schedule any guests because of the uncertainty so I wanted to get something out there uh, also I wanted to expose my large strength coach podcast audience to stop and give me 20 I've been getting some great feedback about the format and about the interviews because we kind of it's not really about sets and reps it's kind of going deeper into uh, everybody's little story so I figured I would uh, kill two birds here and uh, kind of uh, expose my Strength Coach podcast audience to the Stop and Give Me 20 podcast. So uh, I'm basically just going to play it right in its entirety, the whole thing. Uh, so here it is. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 11 of the Stop and Give Me 20 podcast, 20 minutes with some of the world's top fitness pros. I'm your host, Anthony Rana, and you can check out the show notes at stop20podcast.com, that's stop20podcast.com. Before you do that, go to iTunes and subscribe to the show or wherever else you listen to your podcast. Leave us a rating and a review, it'll really help us out because we're a new show. For today's episode, I have on Coach Michael Boyle, and Coach Boyle is one of the foremost experts in the field of strength and conditioning. He's worked with the Boston Bruins, the Boston Red Sox, World Series ring, Boston University, National Championships, U.S. Women's Hockey, Gold Medal. He's the co-founder of Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning, one of the first for-profit strength and conditioning companies in the world. He lectures all over, and his books include Advances in Functional Training and Designing Strength Training Programs and Facilities and the New Functional Training for Sports. But he gained most of his fame for his segment on the amazing Strength Coach podcast. My mentor, my friend, my partner at strengthcoach.com. Coach, thanks for coming on today. So that's perfect. So what do I got, a minute left? I got a 19-minute commercial, and now we're ready to go. Okay. (laughs) Here, that's how this is going to roll. All right. Um, Coach, um, let's let's get right into it. What's that? uh, What's your story? What's What's that spark when you were younger that got you into the fitness lifestyle? I think my story is that, that I sucked at everything. <laughs> That's what got me into the fitness lifestyle. I just wasn't very good. At, my dad was an All-American football player at Boston University. He was in the BU Hall of Fame. I still meet people from Charlestown who remember sort of my father's sporting exploits, and he would be 93 years old right now. And I was – he married, unfortunately, or fortunately. I loved my mom, but she was five feet tall. And uh, most of us ended up somewhere decidedly in the middle, and – I was in the middle of just about everything. I was in the middle of my family. I was in the middle range of ability in terms of I wasn't particularly good at anything. And what I was was analytical, and I would get books. I can remember getting a book on baseball out of the library and trying to read about baseball because I really stunk at baseball, particularly more than I stunk at some other things. But I did start to realize that if you started to try to study things, you could get better. And, And that eventually led me to this idea of, weight training, which if you think in now 1973, maybe the 110 pound weight set, the, you know, the York, the metal weights, the wall chart, I had that whole thing and I was pumping iron in my basement. I was going to start my high school football team if it killed me. And, and literally that was the beginning for me. 
was was uh, baseball and and, and uh, football. Those were like the sports that you kind of were into. No, actually, it's funny. I was really I loved basketball. My father ended up being a, a very successful basketball coach, even though he was a football player in college. And I loved basketball. I ended up my best sport was actually swimming. Strangely enough, it's just something that I was very naturally good at, and I so badly wanted to be the starting small forward on the basketball team with the emphasis on small, but I realized that I was actually going to be the, probably the 12th or 15th man on a 12 or 15 man team and, or the captain of the swim team and one of the best swimmers. And I finally talked myself into the fact that I had to get up at six o'clock in the morning and get in a freezing cold pool. So that was what I did. I still played football, but I, if, as far as what I was good at baseball, never got beyond little league. I actually, uh, I think at 12, I realized that bad eyesight and lack of athletic ability combined to uh, to really make me not very good at that sport. <laughs> you know, what's funny is I think, you know, and you're still known uh, and you still lecture on the hockey circuit. I mean, everybody really assumed you work with the Bruins. BU Hockey was one of your, you know, because, uh, also because of the success of their program. People, so, they know you for hockey and you never really laced up the skates, huh? Right. No, not beyond. I mean, pond hockey, I was lucky enough to be alive during the Big Bad Bruins era in the 70s. I watched hockey games on TV. We watched Bruins games all the time, more to watch the fights than than anything else. And we'd have our own, my brothers and I would have our own fake hockey fights in the basement after the games were over. Yeah. But I never, I've never played in a meaningful hockey game in my life. <laughs> which, And that's, I think, a great example, though, for people in terms of we think about this whole idea that one, that maybe I had to be good at something to coach, which is total bullshit. And two, that it has to be the sport that you played. I mean, I have a World Series ring. That's the, probably the highest achievement that I've gotten in sport is a World Series ring. And, I mean, I, I don't think I ever, like, really picked up a baseball the whole two years I was with the Red Sox. Yeah, that's amazing. And every like, guy that asked me to play catch, I'm like, no, I'm not playing catch. You guys are like 80 miles an hour playing catch. I'm absolutely not going to do that. <laughs> Awesome. Coach, who was your superhero growing up? Who influenced you the most to become the person you are? Uh, my, it was my dad. It really was. I mean, that, my father was a, a larger-than-life character. Unfortunately for me, he died. I think I was 25 when he died, and if I did the math. Yeah, maybe even 23. But my wife never met my dad, which I, I'm sad about it. My dad never got to see me really achieve a whole heck of a lot. I just started working at BU when he passed away. But he was one of these guys that, I mean, literally the school, if you drive by my high school, it's the Arthur P. Boyle building. So they, they named the building after him after he passed away. And his wake was literally like a town parade. So when he died, he used to wakes then were two to four, seven to nine. His wake went from one to 10 for two days. People wow. lined up before it opened, and people were in line after the place was closed. And I mean, I had friends, I still have friends that I remember who waited in line, you know, two hours, two plus hours just to come in and pay their respects because the effect that my dad had on kids was, I mean, really nothing short of amazing in the sense that uh, kids lined up. We had a woman, I mean, and I could, I could tell stories about my dad forever. Uh, but we had a woman who came when my dad passed away. It, in the end, it was a hospice situation where they basically sent him home to die. And we had a woman who came to our house and stayed for three days, who was a nurse, a, a student who, and this was not at that time, she wasn't a student. She was a 40 something year old mom who, and I, I may actually, it's funny, I choke up a little bit trying to tell the story, but she said, I would not be where I am today if it wasn't for your dad. He took me by the hand to the Malden Hospital School of Nursing, brought me in, got me registered, and got me into nursing school. Wow. So, you know, that was the kind of effect that he had. And he had that effect on numerous people. We had, I mean, our insurance guy, everybody, our account, everybody that we dealt with in our life was somebody that he had impacted at school. And most of the people were not the athletes, which I thought I think was something that had an effect on me. He had special needs kids who came over that he took care of. He had guys that were the his basketball managers that he took care of. He just had this nonstop list of people that he was constantly taking care of. I've met people who said my dad bought their sport coat for their senior prom. 
and we didn't have that kind of money for my uh-huh. dad to be out buying sport coats for kids to go to the prom. And then I met another guy who was actually talking about in the days before there was NCAA and violations. I met a guy, um, Carol Lonestein is his name, great guy, Malton High guy who ended up making good, went to Harvard, did really well. And he said, yeah, I used to stop by and give your dad a couple hundred bucks every now and then because I knew that he was buying stuff for kids who couldn't afford whatever it was that they needed to get. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, he's a hard act to follow still to this day. So I always think that, you know, I think for myself and for my brothers, pretty much no matter what we've done, we'll probably always pale in comparison to our father. Yeah. Mike, real quick, did you, do you think you recognize that when you were younger or is it, cause a lot of times we, when we get older, we're like, wow, my parents really did have an effect on me. But when you were younger, were you looking at him like that? I think I looked at him like that, but sometimes I looked at him like he was kind of a pain in the ass because he was one of these guys who didn't smoke, didn't drink, didn't swear. I used to say, like, everything was great in my house as long as we were perfect. <laughs> you know what I mean? As long as we didn't drink, we didn't smoke, we didn't swear, we didn't get in any trouble, then everything was fine. And if it wasn't, I know we had to get good grades, too, so you had to get all A's. So, you know, I mean, it was, it was like my house was a pretty low-pressure environment as long as you were perfect. <laughs> there you go. All right. Um <laughs> Coach, who who who's your superhero now? Who's like somebody you're kind of looking looking up to, looking around, and, and you know, who you're seeing that they're doing great things, and, and you kind of try to emulate. You know, that's a, it's. I've listened to all of these. Stop and give me twenty so far, and that's probably the one that stumps me the most. I think when I was at Boston University, it was Jack Parker, because he was another guy that you know, even though he's only fifteen years older than I am, I feel like. Sometimes I felt like he was a hundred years older than I was. And he was that same sort of guy that when something went bad, you could always count on coach Parker to make sure that he was going to do his best to fix it. When Travis Roy broke his neck, coach Parker threw himself into the process of taking care of Travis. We had another goalie, JP McCurzy who got run over by a car. The same thing. I mean, coach Parker, when, when Mark Davis died, like this, he was just always there in the crisis situations. And so I think, he was that guy as I've gotten, as I got older right now, I don't know. You know, sometimes I I don't know who that person is in my life at this point, but I think when you get to be, I'm pushing 60, which is pretty scary. And I'm 57 years old. And, and I don't know that I have that person as much in my life anymore. Yeah. But I think it's okay to still have that kind of, I want to be like coach Parker was, when I was kind of coming up. So I think it's fine. Oh yeah. No question. I, I actually texted him the other day. I just to say that, you know, I, cause I don't see him as much as I used to since I left the U and I just texted him and thanked him. And we talked a little bit about on the strength coach podcast about the whole gratitude thing, but I really try to, to look back at these people and let them know that, that he was the guy for me when I was 25 years old and he was 40. He was the guy that I wanted to be. Yeah. And, and I always think, you know, I think sometimes you want to pick real tough acts to follow because I don't, I'd probably never be like Jack Parker. He's the, the winningest coach in one sport at one school in the history of the NCAA. I don't know if I'll ever be as good a man as my father was, but if I can get in the ballpark, I'm doing okay. Absolutely. Coach, who, I, actually, I should say besides your kids, because I know you really focus on trying to be a great dad. Um, who are you trying to be a superhero to? You got you, you know, you have all these trainers who you speak to. You have your your staff. You have your interns. You have your kids. Who who are you really when you when when you're doing your your stuff, your your fitness and your strength and conditioning stuff? Who are you really trying to trying to be a hero to? But it really, I, you hit it on the head, though. I mean, I, I have to say my kids first because that's really become the biggest focus in my life because I just realized I'm never going to get this time back, and so. There's no question that that's the, the first and primary focus in my life right now. But after that, you're right. I mean, you know me well enough to know it is the staff. It's the, you know, the kids, cause they're like my kids. And even some of them who, some of my kids who've moved on, I was so lucky last night. I sat at my daughter's hockey game holding Sarah Cahill's baby. And I'm thinking this is exactly the way that life should be yeah. is that you should, you should be able to live through this, this beautiful cyclical process. And it was Payson's first hockey game that he ever saw watching Michaela Boyle play. And I get to sit there with him and hold him for a few minutes during the course of that game. So I think I'm trying to be a good example in every way that I can, whether it is. And it's funny, I constantly get people saying to me that 
that I provide a good example for them of what family should be like. And I'm really proud of that. When I, when someone tells me that, then I think, Hey, I'm doing a good job because I do want to have my kids in the gym and part of my life. And I do want people to see that that's a priority for me and that, Hey, I'm going to leave the gym because the gym has got to be there. And even if the gym was gone, if I saw all the kids games, I'd be okay that the gym was gone because ultimately yeah. no, you know, no one, I don't know. No one's going to give a shit at, at the end of it all. Yeah. So, you know, they, you know, you don't want to be like, Oh yeah. You know, Mike, great, incredible fitness facility owner, shitty dad and husband, yeah. you know, it's like, yeah. You know, you know, that's not, you know, that's not your legacy. That's not what you want people to say. Yeah. I think, you know, when you say that about other people, like I'm one of those people who look up, look up to you as a superhero and say, you know, even if I don't know how great of a dad you always might be, cause you're never going to be the perfect dad. But I think the fact that you, you verbalize that and you, you really do try you, you, everything you do is trying to be that person. You're always working on that and it's part of the process. So I think that's what a lot of us respect about you. Coach, now it's time for the Stop and Give Me Five segment, five rapid-fire questions and answers. So, uh, all right, you're on a desert island. You can bring one book. It doesn't have to be fitness-related. What is it? Again, and I struggled with this because if I'm on a desert island, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to influence any people anymore. But I kept coming back to Seven Habits of Highly Effective People because I think that's a book that I really refer to all the time. And it's longer than How to Win Friends and Influence People. That would have been my second choice, but it's really short. I was trying to think of one that I could read over and over again. Yeah. So I needed something a little bit longer. And I think some ways I was like, geez, I have to think of like a really super long novel that I could just read and start over at the beginning. But but I don't know if that would be <laughs> realistic for me. Uh, perform better. They're coming in. Chris Pryor is going to have the Desert Island One Day Learn by Doing seminar. They can only send one one presenter who's living who is that person that you want you want to see i did Charlie francis i never had the pleasure of and i think when i think of people that have influenced me greatly he's a guy who's been a huge influence on me professionally who has now since passed and who i never had the chance to hear speak in person never had the chance to meet so he would probably be that guy if i'm going to perform better seminar the one guy living or dead I, I, that that'd be my guy what about a keynote speaker? Someone from the past. He's gonna. Chris is gonna have another person. He decided he's gonna have another person. And again, doesn't have to be alive. Would you? Well, who'd you want to see speak? Oh man, I would like to hear probably Vince Lombardi speak. To be honest, awesome. I read Vince Lombardi's. Um, I don't know whatever the book was. At, you know, probably when I was in my teens, winning isn't everything. It's the only thing or whatever it was called. And I was fascinated with the whole. Packers and his way of coaching and although now I think I, you could never be a Vince Lombardi type of coach I think he'd still be you'd love to get him up there and and let him go and, and hear what he had to say I think he'd be and again staying staying in the nice. sports team anyway I don't want to get into uh, yeah. religion or politics so all right cool coach last live music concert you went to I went to Phil Vassar on Friday night actually Country, the country right? Billy Joel, one of my wow. favorite artists of all time. It's just another day in paradise, Carlene. I mean, Jeez. awesome. He, I, I wish he was. Uh, I hope his new record does well, so I can I, hear more of Phil. I, I, on, the, on the next Train Coach podcast, I got to ask you where this whole country music thing came from. But uh, Coach, I know you don't love CrossFit, <laughs> but I want to keep it positive. Tell us one good thing about CrossFit. One good thing about CrossFit, maybe that it's slowing down. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> no, sort of. <laughs> no, I would say in all honesty, there's two things that I really like about CrossFit. One is the community building aspect of what they've done. You can't get away from the fact that they've built an incredibly loyal, allegiant community. And looking at how they did that, you've got to look at that part and take away the training part and say that part is really good. The other thing that they've really done is they've been great for this adult functional training business. I always tell everybody, CrossFit's great for business. And I've said this um, numerous times in terms of, if you watch the old Reebok CrossFit ads, one of the things that you will see is that, to me, they could be an ad for Mike Boyle strength and conditioning. And you know what I mean? Because it's like people doing perfect box jumps yeah. and people doing Olympic lifts yeah. and clean and press. And, and you think, hey, if that's what it looked like, 
we're good. So I think those two things are really positives. Nice. Uh, Coach, what are, are you working on anything right now that's kind of getting you really excited? I know you just opened the other facility, but um, what's getting you excited right now? You know what's actually getting me excited? Believe it or not. So Pat Beef had sent me an email asking about doing a conditioning talk. He said, who do you think the person to do a conditioning talk would be? He wants to do a, a product on conditioning. And I sent back basically, I don't know. I, you know. I don't know if I could come up with somebody that I really think would be the person to do this. And then about two weeks later, he said, I got 10 responses back that people would like you to do it. Do you want to do it? And I thought this would be kind of a fun thing to do. So I've been spending the last couple of weeks really trying to research um, MAS testing, maximum aerobic speed testing and repeat sprint ability testing so that I can really give an effective presentation on designing conditioning programs. So that's something that I, I am, in all honesty, I'm, I'm pretty pumped about. We're going to film it. I don't know. I would say probably in the next month or two, we'll actually film it. But it, I think sometimes people poke me into doing a project that I would never do myself. Much like the new book. I would not have done a new book if it wasn't for Ted Miller from Human Kinetics and him saying this book really needs to be redone. It would not have gotten redone. So I sometimes like when people give you a little shove in a certain direction because it, it makes me get out of my comfort zone. Yeah, yeah, and you know, that's the people are asking for it, so good stuff. Coach, I'm going to change this, not really the letter to your younger self. What's the young, the letter you're going to give to the interns? What's the thing you want the young strength and conditioning coach, the young fitness professional as well, not just strength and conditioning coach, what, what's the advice that you want to give them? I think the biggest probably piece of advice would be sometimes you look at like uh, the H. Jackson Brown books, you know, some of these things and realize that just to, to be a good person, we talk about this all the time. First and foremost, be a good person, have some self-respect. Don't make an ass out of yourself on YouTube. Don't talk about things that you know, nothing about this. There's so much of that stuff that I would want to say to these young kids in terms of be working every day with this idea that you're going to look back at yourself 20 years from now at Joe Ehrman, we talk, you know, inside out coaching, we talk about that 20 year window and be proud when you go back and look through the 20 year window and don't think like, Oh my God, you know, I worked, you know, in a tank top or I worked in a sports bar. Or I worked in shorts with my ass hanging out. You know what I mean? Or, you know, I was a total idiot. And I made YouTube videos of me doing stupid things. And, you know, I so wish I could get the internet to crash so that all this stuff would disappear. Because I think when you're young, particularly now in this age of social media, and I'm glad, I'm glad there was no cell phones and things because there'd probably be some video of me in college doing some really stupid stuff, but there isn't. Yeah. It didn't exist at that point in time. And, but now knowing that these kids, this is the day and age that they live in and that everything that they do, is going to be recorded for posterity. And you've got to conduct yourself that way. You've got to know that, you know, what do I want again? When you think we were talking last night in terms of just the idea of what you want your legacy to be. And, and I think when you've got to start with that, when you're 21 years old and you're right out of school, and I think that's really hard. I had a good, I think I told you this story and then I'll finish cause I must be getting near 20, but I had a conversation with um, a young kid at a, Halloween party. And he was talking about the typical teenager, senior in high school. And his mom was talking about what schools he was going, you know, applying to. And I said, make sure you're doing internships. And I said, did you, what did you do last summer? And he looked at his mom. He was like, oh, I, I played on a couch mostly. And, <laughs> and I just, I looked at the mother. I looked at Cindy. We were all sitting there talking and the son was there. And I said, I just want you to know that when I see anybody who graduates from college and hasn't done an internship in the field, I think loser. And Cindy smacked wow. me. And that's like, <laughs> but that's how I felt. Because I'm thinking, how can you have been in college for four years and not have done something related to your field? Like, how can you be in that situation where your resume is going to say like that you scooped ice cream or that, you know what I mean? That yeah. you, whatever, were a lifeguard. I mean, you, you know, this is the legacy. Like 
think about where you want to be 20 years from now and be that person, be professional, act that way, dress that way. Yeah. Because it's like, fake it till you make it. Yeah. And you know, when we were younger, when we were younger, they used to say, uh, it's going to go on your permanent record. We really didn't have one, but these kids do. So, um, yeah, coach, Thank you so much for doing this. You know that you are uh, probably my ultimate mentor. And, you know, obviously we're partners at strengthquotes.com, but uh, I'm honored to be able to call you a friend. And I, I really appreciate all you've done for me and the industry. So uh, thanks again for coming on today and doing this. Well, I appreciate all you've done for me because I feel like you've done more for me than I've done for you. So that means the relationship is good. And I thank you. All right. That's going to do it for episode 11 of the Stop and Give Me 20 podcast. Although I might have to call it the Stop and Give Me 25 podcast after this one. Thanks again to Michael Boyle. Make sure you check out the links to all of his stuff, including strengthcoach.com at stop20podcast.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the show. Leave us a rating and a review. It'll really help us out. My name's Anthony Renna. Thanks so much for stopping by.